Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy Hazard. And you know, I'm really interested today to talk some deeper and deeper into digital verification, supply chain uh, technologies, different things that they, we are doing in the blockchain around the world, um, and specifically here in the U.S., to be able to look at how these technologies are going to be trustworthy, how they're going to tell us what we want to know, uh, that something's valid, that something's real, that we know where it came from, that we know that it's good quality. Like all of those things intrigue me. So I was very excited when Melanie Noose was presented to me as a potential guest for this show. She is the vice, Senior Vice President of Corporate Development at GS1 US. And GS1 is one of the major companies that does standards across multiple industries not including technologies like blockchain. She leads a team that investigates new technologies, partnerships, and business opportunities to increase the relevance and reach of the GS1 standards. And they are the most widely used supply chain standards in the world. So I'm very familiar with them for my work and product, and I'm interested to hear what they're gonna be doing in technology. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Melanie oversees the exploration of collaboration opportunities to help businesses leverage emerging technologies, including the internet of things, blockchain, and machine learning. Melanie has more than 20 years of retail supply chain experience. Boy, we're right in line there. Mm -hmm. Focusing in recent years on retail industry collaboration to improve inventory accuracy, exchanging standardized product data, and achieving source to store supply chain visibility. I'm really, you know, Melanie, I'm so glad you're coming on the show because this is something that ties so well into my background in product development for for 27 years. Oh gosh, 27 years. And this is the hardest part about designing and developing products, um, any kind, bringing any kind of product to market is that wanting to make sure that you trust all the data that comes through your supply chain, that trust where the products come from, that, that they are what they say they are going to be, and that you can put that, and when you put your brand forward into the world, you feel confident in that. There's just as big a problem on that side as there right. is from a consumer side looking at it going, do I trust this? So there's a lot of mistrust in this whole process. So tell us a little bit more about GS1, because most of our listeners probably aren't familiar with that, and, um, and why blockchain? Sure. We get GS who a lot, Um, (laughs) but you know, GS one has some pretty humble, but very auspicious beginnings because the UPC barcode, which had its 45th anniversary of being scanned in a grocery store this year was where it all started. And people probably didn't really get it at the time, but the amount of errors that were happening at the point of sale with manually keying and price information and just that simple way back when, before we used to call it the cloud, when it really was a cloud, right? Storage was expensive. And so you were keeping price information and things kind of in these third-party provider networks that are now just ubiquitously known as cloud. And so we morphed from there. It was always around unique identity, interoperable, and globally understood. So when you scan the barcode of a bag of potato chips all over the world, that's that bag of potato chips. And when you scan a bottle of soda, you know that that's different. And people, it's funny with self-checkout, people now, they do this all the time. And then when you say, well, you realize each of those identifiers are unique. Oh, I never thought about it. But if every (laughs) barcode were the same, right, we'd have no, no price accuracy. So as we, as we started out with that point of sale use case, it quickly became apparent that capturing information about products, um, putting that in a machine readable format like a barcode, or we now have standards around uh, RFID as well, and then sharing that information with your trading partners, right, to ensure efficiency, cost reduction, 
revenue growth, and I think even increasingly within the past five years, transparency and delight for a consumer or patient safety, those have all really been woven into the key uh, reasons we exist. And as a not-for-profit, which I, I kind of like being in this space because people don't feel threatened by it, right? Standards are really about creating a level playing field upon which companies can compete. And so we get the unique opportunity to listen to executives talk about their supply chain challenges from both sides of the aisle and then come up with a way that will allow them to get ubiquitous adoption, but then deliver that to a suite of technology partners that are going to layer the value on top. I always like to say standards are only as good as the technology that enables them. And that was why three years ago, blockchain came across our desk. People kept saying blockchain is going to replace electronic data interchange. And so if you work in the product space, right, you understand. Right. So if you've ago. ever heard that term, like, you know, EDI, yes. like if you hear that electronic data interchange, it's a very big, it was a very big catchphrase when it first came out. Um, and mainly we heard a lot in conjunction with Walmart way back when, and because they were the best at it. And it's something that, um, that's exactly the same reason why I became intrigued by blockchain. So I was really skeptical about blockchain because you hear the connection between blockchain and cryptocurrency, right? That's the way you hear it all the mm -hmm. time. And so someone asked me to cover a conference on blockchain and, crypt and cryptocurrency. And I said, why would I want to do that? And they said, well, you can interview Steve Wozniak while you're there. And I said, okay, then I, I'll go. <laughs> and over the course of the three days before I met Steve Wozniak, I'm like, there's something really here. Mm -hmm. Do they even understand what this could do for my, our product development business? Could the, do they even understand what this could do for quality of products? Like all I kept thinking was, wow, there's something really missing. They're not talking about here. And then I sat in my first session that talked about it with food safety. Yep. And I thought, oh, somebody's getting it. <laughs> yes. Well, and I think to your point that it goes back to what you were saying at the beginning around trust and what I heard the very first use cases we were looking at with industry were around food around trace back particularly but at the time they were they were intrigued by two benefits I think one was it's a real-time conversation about a specific product whereas EDI is very batch oriented right I put a bunch of purchase orders together and I pipe them off to you um, blockchain was implying that things were happening at the level of the event this is packaged, this is shipped, it's received, I've put it on a shelf. Um, so I think that real-time communication and the other thing the, the, where I think EDI was losing its appeal was it was very linear. The, the retailer sends information to the supplier, the supplier sends it to the shipper, the shipper sends it to the retailer and there wasn't a group conversation and people were very intrigued by the idea that blockchain was gonna allow multiple parties to be involved in everything that was happening with the products altogether. Um, well, and I think that there was a lot of resistance, especially through the ED, EDI process or through the electronic data inter interchange of being, when you batch things, it means that you have to sit there and scan everything in, right? And then right. you have to send your report onto the next level. So when you're talking about the speed of production or low cost goods, it seemed cumbersome. And so you knew in the process, somehow they were just like cheating the system and sending a report, right? Yep. Because I've been in the factories before. I know that's what happens. They get rushed. You know, they got to get enough product out before Chinese New Year and they don't care. And you end up with just a report. And then on the other end, you're going, that's not what we received. Like what's yep. missing here? What happened? And you know, it's supposed to be infallible because it's digital. You're scanning it, but they aren't actually scanning it. And that's, that's, I think the difference between blockchain because there's more of an irrefutable, this has to go through the process, yes. but it also doesn't have to encumber the process. That's right. We, uh, it's so funny because we always like to say garbage in, garbage out faster, right? With technology. And I heard somebody say, garbage in, garbage forever, if you do it wrong on blockchain. So it's one of the things we <laughs> kind of taught industry early on. If you're looking at blockchain as a way to enable traceability, beware. Immutability is a gift and a curse. And uh, while it makes corrections very transparent, so you, right, it's not that you can't amend a transaction, um, but certainly you've just now made written in permanent ink <laughs> when you've made a mistake. Um, but I think to your point, it, that, just writing the report and then the ensuing disputes that would happen, right, as a partner would be trying to reconcile, uh, you're, you're kind of saying you're committing to being real about what you're, you know, putting, putting out there. Well, 
Melanie, you know, thinking about um, so much of the garbage in idea of what you were just talking about, I mean, this is where we really get concerned. So I, over the years, have seen that you get test reports that say this has passed you well, this has done, you know, this has gone through BIFMA, which is a furniture standard, and all of those things, and it turns to find out that it didn't. Right. And it wasn't the right product tested or it was what we call a golden sample. So it was a perfect sample that was made not like it would be made in production. Um, and so all of that is something that I think about because that goes into a permanent um, system that says this is the standards that this product has met. On this, And then when you test against that in the future and all of a sudden you find failure in the process, you think, I have a flaw in my product. What's going on? But the reality was it never met it. And I can't tell you how many times we've actually found that to be the case. So it's so important to get through these, especially when we have something that's a high liability or high risk where someone could seriously get hurt. Yeah, what's so, it's, you know, I love that you bring this up because this is where I think blockchain morphed. I, I remember talking to a professor from University of Arkansas and she was saying kind of crypto was blockchain 1.0. Our original exploration into traceability was probably blockchain 2.0 and where we're gonna land is 3.0 or beyond. But the most interesting thing about blockchain because you, you can get very tripped up on how much data goes on the chain, right? And everybody's like, we're just gonna throw all the data. No, 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 it, to your point of crypto, crypto scales because the transactions are very small and they're high volume. But in a supply chain, when you're moving thousands or millions of products and you want to uniquely identify each one and then talk about it on a ledger, yeah, you're, you're gonna start impacting production or distribution you know, incredibly. And so that was the, but the whole notion of certifications and being able to say that the certificate authority who stands behind that non-GMO project certification or USDA organic, or to your point, right, UL, fair labor, um, you know, fair trade cotton, all of these things. Now, when you start looking at what's happening in the space around decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials and the ability of a company whose job is to credential that one or two specific things, tying that to a ledger that's linked to the identity of that product and now becomes part of its permanent record, you start to move away from that. Uh, someone had once told me that like 46% of the produce grown in the U.S. is organic, but we consume 68% of organic food because people are so, making false claims, like you were right. saying. This actually, to your going back to the trust as sort of the anchor of what we're trying to get to here, this is a way to get all the parties who have the, the provable say to contribute that to the ledger and then create that reputation for the product. So, so there's this, uh, I don't know if it's a TV show or some kind of uh, streaming series, but it's a streaming series on product quality and other things. And they have two episodes so far, one on beauty products, which is super scary in terms of its quality control, and one on furniture, which I know extremely well because I've worked in furniture for my almost my entire career. And so it talks about furniture safety and other things like that. And, you know, tip, uh, uh, tips of dre dressers tipping over, TV stands tipping over. Like these are serious things that happen. And there are tests involved in all of those. And here's, here's the thing that I think that most people don't understand. That when, when you're a brand, you want to do a good job. Your brand's out front. You want to make sure that that quality is there, that all of these things. And you try to do that in the process, but you're also not standing there with your product every moment along right. the way. And so someone does something that's untrustworthy and you really can identify it. And you, you know, you get what is a very inexpensive dresser, like something in Ikea, think about that, like under a hundred dollars. And you don't really have the budget, the time, all of those things to go back and recheck everything in the process either. So you get false certification reports, you get things that weren't really tested, but a report was submitted. And you believe that your process is good until something occurs and something goes wrong. Right. And that's when you start to find out. And sometimes it can be devastating, like kids got hurt. Right. And so that's where you sit along the way going, wow, I tried so hard to make a really good brand, but I failed at it because the process itself, I didn't understand every little nuance and I couldn't control it. 
Yeah, you can't control consumers, right? They, they'll do crazy things with your stuff. One they'll of, still do crazy things on that end. Yeah. That's so true. But, uh, but you also can't control every supplier along the way. That's and that's right. the thing. You know, so we've seen things where, you know, you had a flaw coming in from an incoming material that you could never have anticipated right. was going to have a problem and um, a contamination or something like that. And then all of a sudden you say, okay, now I got to put controls in place at the incoming material level. And you learn stuff, but you learn stuff by failure yes. in the product development process. And a lot of times you can't identify where that failure point happened. And I would say that even translates to what we're doing with blockchain, right? We've been learning yeah. through some of the failures where original notions around blockchain you think about consensus and sort of that 51% rule that exists in cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Could you really afford 51% consensus in a supply chain blockchain? No, the whole thing would grind to a halt, right? So we're, <laughs> we're always balancing performance. But I think the other thing too is in, a, in an anonymous world like cryptocurrency, trust was never at issue. You didn't trust it. You don't know these people. You're never going to meet them. You're exchanging value. In a supply chain, you're not generally going into it completely blind, right? There are trust elements and how do you back those up with um, you know, certifications or, or um, assertions made on the blockchain. But also I'm gonna do business with you because I like what you offer, right? I like your terms. We've talked about production processes, like we've, we've developed some trust. And so I think this is why leveraging emerging tech like blockchain actually built on what we already have in place as good supply chain partners saying, right, we're going to do some trust as well. Um, but I, I did want to, I wanted to piggyback on your comment around, oh, the kind of the un, unintended consequences. So right. one of the incredible things I've seen that I believe if we can get to Nirvana with blockchain and maybe I'll be retired by then, one hopes. Um, like you, I remember like when I was the youngest person in the room and I, right. <laughs> Um, but I actually had, I, my husband can't stand it when we go out shopping because it's always research. I'm always trying to see, you know, product packaging and identity. And, um, so I've been in a grocery store where I've seen expired frozen pizzas in a freezer case because the expiration date on the pizza is human readable, right? It's not, uh, it, it's not in a machine readable way. So you're relying on labor, probably very low cost labor in that store to go out and constantly scan your shelves and look for expired product. So one, we talk about putting identity better embedded right into the barcode on the product and then leveraging the, the records that you're gonna build on this ledger to deliver on use case like expiration or recall. But I think the converse of that is true. I went to buy a car seat for my on his way grandson um he was he was arriving soon and he needed a car seat and i went to a store to buy this and they would not sell it to me saying the product had been recalled so first of all the product they was caught it right at the point of sale yes. i love that that's like my favorite use case when i talk to people thinking about like the fact that in the amount of time it might take you while you're shopping for you know eggplant or something and you get up to the to scan it and they say oh wow we just had a recall yes. on this you don't want to buy it how wonderful is that as a consumer, right? right? You feel so taken care of. And then, and I think then the the kind of follow on to that is we have to empower associates to give you alternatives, right? So this is the challenge of like where technology meets humans. And then now we say you can even further, instead of this product, what you want to be recommending is right this other product. So to your point, now I feel safe but now I want to feel satisfied. You still have a need, right? Yes. You still got to get a car still, seat. I still need that. So, um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, but you know, that is, that's the perfect case use case that I look at when I, when I think about product safety and I think about, you know, food safety and all of those things. I think about that as the speed of it saves lives. It, yeah. it you know, there's no question about that. Um, because I've seen it go so very wrong on the other side. By the time they catch up, multiple children have, have died. Yeah. So this is we had this case where I came in to work for a company that did beanbags. And three children had died mm -hmm. before they came to me. And, I, and they, they came to me because they were losing $20 million of business every year now because no one wanted to buy their beanbags. No kidding. But now you come to me to like make them safer. Why didn't you do it before? Right. right. And so, you know, so thinking about how you can do these things and, but the minute something goes wrong, 
that's when you go, I have an alert. I know what to do. We, we can take this down before it becomes a brand nightmare, before it becomes a liability, before it becomes a disaster for some, for more families too. Right. So thinking about that, I love that part of blockchain. That's what I'm really excited about. But, you know, there are some questions about how does this really work? You know, how does this digital verification build trust? Like it isn't, it's still possible that there's fraud in the system, as you put it, garbage in. So what are some of the things that GS1 is putting in place to sort of standardize that, to make it more clear? Sure. Well, as much as I love the UPC, and I like to joke that it outlasted the floppy disk in terms of a 45-year <laughs> legacy as a technology, it is just, in the U.S., it's a 12-digit number embedded in a barcode, and outside the U.S., it's a 13-digit number. And it really just says, you know, you look me up, my price is X, I go beep. And so, right, every bag of regular flavored potato chips of brand X has that same number. And where we're moving, not only, so you look at blockchain, but let's look, talk about the emergence of some other technologies like IoT, where sensors can now be applied relatively inexpensively to all kinds of things. Furniture is a great example because it's a higher margin product, right? That might right. be a, a good first foray. Cans of of vegetables are not always good because it's low margin. But if you think instead of just identifying this 15 ounce can of peas, I'm going to identify every 15 ounce can of peas uniquely. Uh, we call this standard GS1 digital link. And so it, it's about taking a serialized UPC, if you will. So making a separate one for each, one, uh, each product and then embedding that in a 2D barcode now, actually, I can enable exactly what you're talking about because unique identification of each thing sitting on a shelf or in a department store on a rack allows me to count it better, more accurately, more often. It allows me to connect with the consumer on an individual basis, whether that's for warranty, registration, um, to your point around safety, we, we talked about a little bit about expiry and recall, um, but then it also allows me to enrich the consumer's experience in a really phenomenal way. So I would say that we are, a couple of our critical uh, aha moments around blockchain were first, have the data. Because if you don't have data, you're just moving a lot of empty records fast and that won't help. But two, you're going to have to get more granular with identity. And um, I would say that this is being accepted. And, and it's not like it's not there in certain cases. But, like yes. I, I think about, you know, we think about materials, there's always color and lot numbers. So the yes. incoming material has that marked. Does it make its way into the final product? A lot of times, no, but it could. And now you have traced back all the way to the material source or different factories make different things. So you have different facilities around the world, especially in food products. You actually like beverages and other things. I mean, even Starbucks cups, they're all actually made more local to the Starbucks yeah. of their region. They're not made in one source and shipped all over the world like people think that they are. Right. And so you have differences in the manufacturability of each one of those and where did they come from? What was that factory source? So you have all of these different variables that are being tracked in some way, shape or form, but maybe it's only on the carton and not on the inside of, of each of the products. So yeah. that's where, you know, getting granular, as you put it, is going to be very valuable because now you know exactly where that came from and you don't have to do this deep investigation into it, you'll be able to tra track it. Yep. And I think using recall, um, which, you know, is a good, good example and a bad example, but recall for now is about wholesale pulling stuff off shelves, right? We, we've had some leafy green challenges in the past 15 months and <laughs> Nobody can eat salad anymore because it's- I know, I'm always like, is it safe to eat romaine now or not? I don't know, I'm so confused. <laughs> yes, but when we can start proving to consumers that we have the level of identity that we need to say, this is the thing that we need to pull from the shelf, but not this other thing, consumers, we, it's, it's gonna be, right, a chicken and egg. Like we have to be able to prove it and their confidence will build and the trust will grow. But I, I really look forward to a time when millions of dollars in sales aren't lost for sections of an industry like leafy green producers and all of the people involved in that supply chain. Because well, it, can, and environmental issues like this yeah. is what I we throw away so much product. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah. you, you know, I mean, and sometimes it can be from a minor quality flaw that you never hear about. That's not even a recall. I have seen it done on furniture. I've seen furniture destroyed. And it was something that could have been fixed, but it was cheaper to destroy it all than it was to go find the ones that had the flaw and fix it. Right. That's just such a shame. And we think about all those materials, all that wood or, you know, yes. whatever it was that was lost in that process. 
Well, and, and that also leads to the circular economy concepts we're starting to see really take root, which is how do I give this product a life post-consumption? So to your point, maybe it's before it ever started because we had a flaw, but let's not waste all those materials, but let's leverage the identity of, of what those materials were for some other purpose. And so when we talk about embedding that unique identifier with that product and letting it persist, you may have seen recently, I saw a video um, around how they're trying to better automate recycling. And so as packaging comes into a recycling facility with an embedded identity that they can then link through the cloud, to what is the material composition of this product, right? Which type of plastic is it? If it's an apparel product, is it cotton and spandex? Is it polyester? Being able to tell those things using machines is gonna allow us to scale recyclable recyclability. Um, I think it's gonna lead to some new business models for recycling companies, but it's also gonna help drive circularity that will then lead to sustainability because right we, right. we throw away so much. And that was one of the challenges um, I had a professor from MIT kind of throw down the gauntlet at me a couple of years ago, I asked him, you know, what about persistent identity as a lead in towards circular economy? And he says, we don't have a circular economy. We have a consumption economy. It's true. We're almost trained to just throw things away, right? I don't want this anymore. Throw it away. But well, and you know, and some of like very early on in my career, I worked for Herman Miller and we had a cradle to grave um, model. Right. So we had to think about what it was going to happen at the end and we had to build it in and design it in from the beginning. And it's important to think about that. But we were still always challenged by the idea of the recycling's not there yet. Even though we know this material is highly recyclable, there's not an economy for it or there's not a, a place to send it to. You'd have to separate the pieces. Yep. Right. And so you're always thinking about those things, but there wasn't a good solution always. So getting to a place at which that is more automated, easier to find you have different locations to send it to, whatever that might be, that's going to be extremely viable in actually turning us into that circular economy, yep. which, you know, today it's not, it's so manual. Yep. And distributed data is really the foundation of that, right? Because if you, it's so many people contributing to the record of a product over time that you, I don't know how you could do it without distributed data. And I think that's yeah. where blockchain. I also think is. consumers are getting into this place of like, I mean, it just happened to me the other day when my, my mom just flipped out because she found out that they weren't recycling everything that she was putting in a recycle bin. And, and so she, you know, that's where consumers are like, we've been doing this so long and mm -hmm. then you're not even recycling it. Now they're frustrated. And so, you know, we, we end up into that situation as well. And so at least you maybe can have a data report coming up from your recycling agency that you're paying to take away your goods that says, hey, we've recycled 90% this month. Yes. Uh, yay yay yes. us, right? We've managed to do it. Um, you know, that's, that's, I think, a future of this as well. Well, let's talk a little bit about the challenges, though. I mean, GS1's getting involved from as an outside outsider in a way, right? You know, you're an independent third party. And what are some of the challenges with trying to pull this all together in, in different industries? Sure. Well, I would say the biggest challenge standards always faces is the perception of competitive differentiation, right? One company thinks if I do this, I'm going to be the leader, I'm going to be better. And we've been very fortunate that some of our strongest members, which are, it is the retail industry, right? It is the healthcare industry that, that utilize standards um, and bring their community along. They've said um, data is not a competitive differentiator. What we do with the data most definitely is, but the need for data, because the consumer is demanding it, the patient requires it, we have to do this. And so uh, what, what, what the challenge I saw historically around standards is people would go explore emerging tech, build something cool, and then they'd hit this adoption plateau. Like I can only do this with certain number of trading partners. And then they come to GS1 and say, here, we need to standardize this so that we can get um, you know, 100% adoption. And we serve that role, that's where standards came from. And what we learned in the past few years, it really happened with Omnichannel where the consumer forced Omnichannel on retail, it wasn't retail that made the decision to be anywhere anytime. Consumers were So like, very true, oh. I've written a few articles on that, yeah. Yeah, I can buy this anywhere, where I want, get it shipped where I want, oh. And so we had a few of our members say, I don't want the next Omnichannel retail to catch me by surprise, I want you to help me look around the corner. And it took a, a mind shift for us as well 
from being standards facilitators to emerging technology explorers. And so that was really how, you know, we call it a GS1 US corporate development, but we're the innovation team. And our job is to look at two to 10 years out, what's gonna happen, what technologies will impact supply chains. And then of course, all of the people down to the consumer and up to the producers and, and raw material suppliers. How does technology and standards intersect to make that better, improve that experience? And so, um, you know, I, I, like I said, we're, we're extremely, I feel very fortunate in that members have always kind of put their arms around us and, you know, encouraged us to move forward. But we, blockchain has really been just reinvigorating the conversation around data sharing. And, and in fairness, people had been resting on their laurels, right? If you go back to electronic data interchange, people implemented EDI 20 years ago and then said, yeah, we've done it. We got purchase we're order, good. we've got invoices, <laughs> they're all electronic, we're good. And Everybody like, knows when we're out of inventory and it's on them. <laughs> yes, right? But this need for like that real-time visibility and anyone in the chain being able to contribute to a positive experience if they know, and you look at uh, machine learning and ways to better ingest data, digest it and, and use it for intelligent insights. You look at blockchain as a way to distribute it and kind of share that information across parties. And you look at IOT also as a way to automatic, do an automated gathering of that data. Like how, how cool is it that whether you're in a supply chain environment or even in your home, if you choose, cause I, I'm not trying to scare people who have privacy concerns away, but if you choose, right, you can opt into an experience that says, let my devices tell you some things about me and about my preferences that will allow you to drive convenience for me, right? There are some consumers who want everything from the auto brewed coffee to the shower on their desired temperature to it all converges when I- The lighting being perfectly- <laughs> Yes, right? As soon as I walk in the door, oh, it all happens. <laughs> Um, yeah, I want, I want, you know, I want that beauty ho Hollywood beauty uh, lighting yes. every time I walk into a room, please. Yeah, you know, yes. exactly. No, but you know, this is the thing is like, what I think most, most people don't realize most consumers don't realize the press that is going to happen, the push that is happening into being able to come to some kind of standards at this stage. You know, think about it this I just read an article about the amount percentage of returns that Amazon is expecting post holiday. Yeah. It is something like 77% returns. And they're, they now have pushed omni-channel returns. Like that's what I'm calling it right yeah. now, right? Means you can return at Kohl's, you can return at Whole Foods, you can return at all these places. And all you have to do is bring the product with you. They'll package it right back up for you. Yeah. They'll do everything. You don't even have to do that anymore. And the minute it gets scanned, it's back in the system again at Amazon. Now, no one's inspected it. Like there's a whole gonna be a whole host of issues yeah. about what happens with these returns because returns have to be tracked as well because you can't just return something to in inventory without an inspection process. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, general retail. Yeah. And so there's a whole bunch of issues that are going to go on with that. And, and Amazon has to deal with third-party sellers and the quality of those third-party sellers and as the expose on beauty products. Amazon's one of the worst places to buy beauty products mm -hmm. because there's no controls on the third-party sellers. So the contaminants are high. So looking at all of that, they are going to have to, they're so large right now that it's going to have to push a uh, data interchange in a different way mm -hmm. so that they can take control of it because they are not a source before Walmart was controlling the source, they, they could demand all their suppliers comply, right? But Amazon's not that way. They keep that independent level. So now they have to rely on a company like yours to say, we got to put some standards in place that everybody has to comply to play in the retail market. Right. And so I, I think you guys have a great challenge ahead of you yeah. in terms of, because there's so much and it's moving yeah. so fast, right? But, um, and there's a lot of, um, and there's still a lot to play out on the industrial blockchain side. It's not like one in, one blockchain's emerging as That's at right. the forefront. So that I think is complicating the difficulty for you at this stage right now. The technology hasn't quite matured enough. Yep. We've been very focused on interoperability and how do we get the different platforms to talk to one another technology aside, the data needs to be shared. And so, um, you know, we try to float, it's finding, threading that needle of the space we need to be floating in to help people without hindering them. Yeah. So, so is there anything else you want us to know about what you're working on, Melanie, that, um, that people, you know, maybe even some use cases that you've seen that are already emerging that you think have great potential? Um, well, you know, as you were talking, 
there was something you were saying and I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it led me to, you know, we've talked a little bit about food and we've talked kind of about hard goods and, and apparel where I think you have good, um, really great examples of, you know, whether it's cradle to grave or even source and getting some producers, growers, uh, kind of the whole protein supply chain, right? All these people who really weren't part of the electronic record of an item, how do they participate? Um, another interesting one that has a just a slightly different flavor is food service, because you think about the ingredients going into a restaurant and how mm -hmm. they are transformed before they come out as your final dish. And we're seeing some really cool stuff where now the materials all come in, you know, it's different, different types of produce and they, they all have an identity. I'm a tomato, I'm a bell pepper, um, I'm spinach. Maybe we'll, we'll stay away from the other challenging greens for, for now. I'm arugula. Arugula seems to be. <laughs> arugula seems safe, right? Yes. There you go. <laughs> um, but now I'm going to right, chop those things up and put them together. And so I've taken three identities and I do something we like to call transformation, link them together, transform them into this beautiful salad, which is so healthy and delicious that carries its own identity. And now you can actually also link that salad. And you're seeing this happen um, even in loyalty apps today, right? What was your last order? And a lot of them are really good at saying that, but now tying you to that unique bowl of food or plate of food that was created specifically for you. Um, I think technology has unlocked the world of, of universal unique identity is available to us. Anything can be uniquely identified. We have base standards around connecting the dots from where it began to where I consumed it or, or used it. Um, and now what we're trying to do to what you just said a minute ago is ensure that the technology matures to meet that need. Because the worst thing I think that could happen is people lose interest. Like I, I got bored of waiting for blockchain. So I decided I couldn't to wait for it any longer. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I did, I went on and did something different. <laughs> yes. And which, which then like takes you all the way back to the beginning, right? I got this far up the hill and now I'm going to start and chase a different hill. So I think really trying to, I always like to say, be, you know, be persistent and pleasant about it, but don't, we get weary when we hit this trough of disillusionment that the analysts like to talk about with blockchain. I think we're going to miss that big upswing of value. That's, that's on its way. So, um, you know, for us, it's continuing to stay focused on identity, on uniqueness, and, and also then ensuring that technology delivers on the foundational business requirement that supply chains have. And um, so we kind of bring the members or the members bring us and it, it's just a, it's a happy, a happy family moving forward. Um, but I think really interesting times, just given how rapidly things are changing, even then when maybe you and I started our careers, which yeah. was probably. Yeah, I'm, I'm really actually energized and excited about it. And I'm excited about it from not just the sort of trackability and traceability and, and, you know, building more trust in the process, like we've been talking about here today, but I'm also more excited about the brand opportunities on the other yeah. side, because when we can really share Show, we've done something really unique. We can also embed in this process a beautiful video about how something was produced and handmade mm -hmm. and in oh, a specific yeah. country or in a specific place. And now we can start to deep dive into, you know, the craft of what we've been doing. That I think is really exciting too, like the future of that, because we're getting to some of that in, in, uh, in some apparel industries and, you know, and some other things where we're talking about, you know, how stuff was designed and, and beautiful objects. And we can do it at a higher end, but when we can do that, because the data is all there all we have to do is hey let's link a little video let's link a little story let yeah. you know that marketing opportunity helps people really start to build trust with our brands too Agreed. at a much deeper level that shows that we care at every point along the way and we are doing our very best to ensure quality safety and beautiful designs or whatever that might be that our brand cares about. So I look forward to that stage of it. And I'm, I'm not going to hit the trough of disillusionment. That's not who, that's not what we do here. Our point here at the new trust economy is make sure we keep pushing you through because there's viability, there's great use cases. And there are people like you and GS1 working towards making sure that, that these things continue to move forward. Yes. So Melanie, thank you so much for enlightening us today and, and bringing some information today. And I hope we'll keep in touch and let us know as standards go in, you know, like what these are and, and why they're important as you start to build more and more standards in the future. Yes, we'll do.
Well, Melanie Newts, everyone, Senior VP Corporate Development at GS1 US. You will be able to connect with Melanie and with everything that's going on at GS1 via the blog post for this episode at newtrusteconomy.com. And of course, you can reach out and converse with us about this idea of maybe, you know, refund omni-channel and uh, the future of blockchain, internet of things, all of those things that you want to have a chat about or maybe a little bit of debate. You can do that uh, um, at New Trust Economy everywhere on social media. So until next time, I'm Tracy Hazard on the new Trust Economy. You've been listening to the new Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring the new Trust Economy with us.